Welcome back everybody, High Tech Lab here. I swear, sometimes my parents don't know when to stop on power usage. This is their 14 kilowatt diesel generator, and as it stands, it has 22,783 hours. It's due for an oil change. It's supposed to be done every 250 hours. They're at 460 hours. It's ridiculous how much they run this thing living off the grid. So there's a couple problems we're also having. They're running it so much because we installed a 2,500 amp hour battery bank for them. And to charge that battery bank, it takes way too long. And this thing doesn't like staying charging. Let's get a close up on what that looks like. So here inside the wiring compartment, you can see it's starting to load up, but it's not really very stable. This is loaded by two Solark 12Ks in parallel. And while the Solarks are absolutely awesome inverters, with the pretty nasty power this generator is putting out, it really just isn't cutting it. And you can see it's spending a lot of time right now at zero amps because the inverters have disconnected. And by the time they reconnect, they don't stay connected long enough to do any meaningful charging. So this is really just sitting here idling and wasting fuel. It's a little bit ridiculous. So here are the inverters inside. They're just running, doing their thing. Nothing too crazy to see here. Um, but uh, this is the setup. That's just the inverters and the battery banks. The inverters charge the battery bank, whether it's from solar or from generator power. And they just kind of transfer back and forth to generator power right now. We've tried just about every setting, but the power coming from that generator is just that bad. When EG4 released their charge verter, I was very excited because this essentially means we can run all of the power straight to the batteries. Now, for this 14 kilowatt generator, three would be pushing the limits of the generator, but two I don't feel like would be quite enough. Let's look at their battery banks so you can see just how much capacity they have. And here you go. These are the 25 SOK server rack batteries. They're not in a rack. They're just stacked on top of each other because that's all we had space for. And they do still have 720 amp hours of CALB 180 amp hour cells um, on the other bank. But this is their new bank that they're running. So I really wanted to install three of these charge verters. However, there's 12 of them. What the heck, you might be asking? Let's go take a look. I present to you this monster. This is an 80 kilowatt, 100 kVA, Cummins Onan six cylinder engine um, diesel generator. This thing is turbocharged and absolutely massive. Now, this came to us uh, used. We bought it for $6,000 from a friend of the family that just needed it gone. And it was wired for 277Y480. Um, and uh, here on the property, we have another issue. Everything is single phase. So this can be rewired for single phase output. However, you only get about 50 kilowatts of capacity because you're not using all of the generator's windings. So if we run this at 12208, we get the full 80 kilowatts output. So that's what all those charge verters are in there for. We're going to be setting up 12 of them, and it's going to take just about the full output of this generator and turn it into DC power to charge the battery banks. Ideally, we're going to be around 1,200 amps going into the batteries, but I know it's going to taper down a little bit as the voltage goes up. We're probably going to be around 1,000 amps, but I think it's an excellent use of this generator and the charge verter to convert that three-phase power into single-phase power and instead of taking potentially days with the 14 kilowatt generator to charge their batteries, this could theoretically charge their batteries in about two hours, depending on what their state of charge is, obviously. Um, but I think that's much more feasible than just putting a bunch of wear and tear on too small of a generator. And it also solves the problem of converting the three phase to single phase um, and, and just being efficient about things. So we're gonna start installing the charge verters and we'll take you guys along for the ride here. So here on the back wall of their off-grid electrical room is where we're going to be working. There is a outlet back here we got to take off because this is the wall we're going to just fill with charge verters. So here we are. They're all mounted. This is just absolutely amazing and crazy to look at. You're probably asking how are we going to wire these up, especially when there's going to be 1,200 amps coming out. Well, I'm going to be using the Victron Lynx distributor. This is a modular bus bar system that has four fuse holders inside. I'll show you closer detail in a second. But I'm going to have essentially, um, I haven't decided yet, three or four of them on the right-hand side. And then I'm going to run a 4-aught cable to their other distribution. 
and tie it into the, the rest of their bu bus bars. So there will be either three or four uh, four aught cables going to their main uh, system bus bars. So I haven't totally decided yet how that all is going to lay out, but that's going to be the DC side. There's some Unistrut in the way here on the right hand side. That's going to go away, and you can probably see on the corner of the camera the um, Lynx distributor over there on the wall that's their current bus bar. So I'm going to distribute the load. That way I don't exceed the 1,000 amp rating of the Lynx distributor. For AC power, <clears throat> I'm going to put an electrical panel here. It's going to be a 225 amp, three-phase, 42-space panel, and that will use 24 of the spaces to power the charge verters. There will be a 2.5-inch conduit out the back, and that conduit will have three 250 MCM cables going to the generator, as well as some other cables, you know, for neutral and ground. But the main power cables are going to be 250 MCM to handle the output of that generator. All of these cords will get stripped back and the ends cut off and landed right into the panel, right onto the breakers. And the cables on the right, I don't have the right lugs. These are 25 millimeter squared cables and that correlates to about four gauge. Unfortunately, I don't have the lugs. I already started trimming the ones on the bottom and sadly, I can't hook those up right now because I don't have the lugs to crimp on. Um, you know, oversight on my part, I thought it was two gauge on there, but live and learn. Well, we've made quite a bit of progress so far. I've got the top four and second group down of four charge verters hooked up to the Lynx distributors. You can see here I'm using the 125 amp mega fuses and then I will tie 4 aught cable onto the end of the bars. The 4 aught cable I'll be using is rated for 454 amps max and this will be in free air. So it should be no problem with the continuous output of these four charge verters going onto it. So I got to get the bottom one wired up. Those uh, cables I, are the ones that I cut before I um, realized I didn't have the lugs, so I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do there. But um, eventually, all of these other cables that are here on this other side, the black and reds, will be shortened with the proper lugs added going into the Lynx distributor. I just don't have those lugs right now and we'll need to do that at a different time. All right, and as you guys know, these projects get going really quick and it's hot as heck outside. So stopping doesn't really sound like very much fun. So I have all but the bottom three charge verters wired into the Lynx distributors. I have a 2000 amp shunt over there on the wall and equal parallel length runs going to the main Lynx distribution bar. Um, each charge verter has its own 125 amp fuse, so everything is fused. I will be hard wiring them into the panel and then if I had four gauge lugs, I would not have all of these positive and negatives here on the left. So eventually I'll get lugs and cut all those wires a lot shorter um, because this is just an absolute mess right now. I have my feeders into the panel. They were a little bit long and currently are going all the way across the room, but that's just kind of how this goes. I need to get them cut and landed here on the lugs of the panel. Now there is no main breaker in this panel because the main breaker is outside in the generator. This is a separately derived system, so I will be using the neutral and ground bonding jumper supplied with the panel. And we do need to get this grounded to the container's electrical system. So a little bit of work ahead of us. I need to get the uh, feeds hooked in. But um, yeah, other than that, let me show you in the generator. So this is the old breaker we had in that Clark's holding here. This is the new breaker. This is the 225 amp breaker. I am currently out of phase tape, so none of these wires are um, phased quite yet. I have my ground and neutral cables down here that I need to get terminated correctly. Um, looking at this generator, you guys haven't really seen inside. This is the six cylinder uh, Cummins engine. And if we go around the other side, we have the exhaust over here that just moves a ridiculous volume of air. The batteries, brand new batteries in here because the old ones were shot. Some lovely new battery cables. There is the turbocharger for it. It is quite nice. Then we have the behemoth two and a half inch liquid tight conduit going into the LB feeding into the back of that panel. I do need to make some connections here in the junction box where you essentially tap for 277, 480 or 120, 208 
and or all the other configurations. I need to get some heat shrink, especially on this connection here where all the neutrals join together. Minor details here finishing this up, but um, yes, it has been quite nice. This is the control panel through here. You can see this does support auto start and quite a few other functions. Um, but yeah, more as it happens. And here we are. It was a late night last night, but I got everything in and wired up. All of the charge verters are in. I changed out the couple at the bottom that had too short of a cable because I didn't have the lugs. I had two spares here. So now they're all in and wired up and we are ready to get the panel cover on and get the power on. Now this isn't my prettiest panel makeup ever but these cords were only just long enough to strip and land on the breaker, and I really didn't feel like installing all the twist lock outlets for this many chargers. Next step, add some power. This thing is loud and has a ton of air coming out of it. To show, I have my dad here as a prop, and that thing <laughs> is just hilarious, the way it just absolutely blows so much air out of the front. So these are powered on now, everything fired up just fine. I'm going to set the voltage on them to 56 and a half volts and I'm going to limit the output current to 85 amps because I need to upgrade some of my fuses to be a slightly larger fuse otherwise these will uh, overcome the, uh, the fuse size. Now the reason I can upgrade them is because I have 4 aught cabling going to my batteries only on a 200 amp fuse and I'll be upping that to a 300 amp fuse still well within the rating of the 4 aught cable. So something to note about this generator and part of why it was such a good deal, this actuator right here is what drives the fuel injection pump to set the engine speed. There is no power to this actuator for some reason, so we need to troubleshoot that. For the time being, this is the way it came from the previous owner. The throttle linkage, literally this moves right here, it's set with a zip tie. So uh, the, the problem is as this loads down, the frequency drops. Now, if we were running through multiple Solarks, for example, we would probably run into a scenario where we hit the low frequency cutout, and at that point, it's going to disconnect from the generator and unload. Since we have these charge verters, they actually can work on 50 hertz as well as 60, so it's no problem that this loads down a little bit because this can't actually pull the fuel injection pump, this leakage can't pull to um, inject more fuel essentially and speed the motor back up to maintain the frequency. Now this is fine because the generator has an automatic voltage regulator so it can maintain the output voltage and consistent current. It's just the frequency that changes. So I'm not really going to worry too much about this because we have those charge verters in between, but this is one of the advantages to doing DC rectification instead of feeding it through the inverters as an AC load. And you're probably wondering why they need all this battery charging capability. That is because they have 2,500 amp hours of SOK server rack batteries over here. And on this side, they have another 720 amp hours of CALB CA180 raw cells. Now these are all in parallel and it charges all of these at once, but you can imagine if they get into a deficit, it takes a lot of power to get all this charged back up. While they do need to add more solar, this is a good temporary fix for the price and they also have a few structures they need to build to put that solar on. So it's kind of holding them over until they can solve the root cause of the issue and that is not having enough solar power. And here's the final shot. I have a shunt over there. It's tied into my PLC system and you can see right now our whole combined capacity is 86%. And right now we're charging at 47.3 kilowatts. 
Right now, this is how many kilowatt hours are missing from the battery bank till full. So you can see it's charging quite quick. Like I mentioned in the very beginning, I'm anticipating like two to three hours charge time. So anywho guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay tuned for more. And if you're looking to purchase any of the products you've seen in this video, I'll put links down in the description below. Thank you again and we'll talk soon.